I want to start our time together today by reading a verse out of Isaiah chapter 40, verse 8. It says, the grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of the Lord, our God, endures forever. The grass withers, the flowers fade, fall rather, excuse me, but the word of of our God endures forever. That's why we're in this in this scripture every day, getting after making Bible study the first part of our day, making the scripture alive in our life, because everything passes away, but the word of God does not pass away. Somebody say amen. So we're going to start today, Mark chapter 13, Mark chapter 14. Some will join us by live broadcast. Most will watch this on a rebroadcast um, sometime in the future. And so we want to encourage you to um, <clears throat> read Mark chapter 13 and 14 in preparation for the study. Of course, again, you're welcome to join us live. Um, but that will help you uh, really connect with the material. We're doing a survey. This is an in-depth Bible study. This isn't a quick devotional. This is an in-depth study of two chapters, a survey of the book of Mark. Um, and so it's great when you share. It's great when you uh, let people know about this. First of all, it's a good witness. So when you share, you're showing the world. The more, do you know there's a form of accountability when you witness? When you show the world, look, I'm following Jesus. I'm going to be uh, a disciple of Christ in front of everyone. Not a secret Christian, not a closet Christian, but a uh, an out front Christian. When you do that, it creates a form of accountability so that, um, you know, if you're tempted to do something wrong, people will come back and go, Hey, I thought you saw on your Facebook, you're posting scriptures and uh, Bible study. So you better get it together, pal. All right. So let's pray. Father, thanks for uh, a new day. Every day uh, is a new day under your grace. It's a new opportunity to know you, to grow in you, to walk with you, to seek your forgiveness, your healing, um, and your perfection that you've laid out for us, Lord, because you're a perfect father. Thank you for this moment in time that we can study your word, let it go deep in our hearts, and let it establish us, Lord, in you, in Jesus' name. And everybody said, I didn't hear you. Do you think just because you're watching on video, you don't have to say amen? You better say amen. Come on. Amen. All right. Mark chapter 13. Jesus is talking a lot in this chapter about his second coming. And while some of the things that he says is very important regarding the second, not some of all of what he says is important regarding the second coming, it's also, it has other applications as well. Verse nine really spoke to me. He said, you must be on your guard. You must be on your guard. Sometimes because we know and understand that God is so big, that God loves us, that we uh, are his children. We sometimes are a little lazadaisical uh, in our pursuit of him and our life and what the enemy is up to, what ki the kingdom of heaven is up to, what our flesh is susceptible to. And because of that, we kick back a little bit and we don't take things Seriously, and we don't pay attention. Some of following God is just paying attention. And again and again in this chapter, Jesus is like, be watchful, pay attention, look out, watch and pray, make sure you're on your toes. And we, we, we would do good to have more of this in the church. In the church, we want to convince people overwhelmingly so much again and again how much God loves you and thinks you're great and wants to give you a trophy. And again and again, how God's got this. He's got this. He's got it. Yeah, he does have it, but we have to watch and pray. Jesus said it again and again. You must be on your guard. What does that not mean? That does not mean be paranoid. Doesn't mean be paranoid. I know there's so much paranoia and conspiracy theory weirdness and people know about more about reptilian overlords and, oh gosh, flat earth and all kinds of just stuff. God bless you. I mean, you know, 
I, you just wonder, you know, if people are wrapped that tight at all, actually. But anyway, the, when we know so much about just weird stuff, and then you want to talk to somebody about the Bible, and they're like, I'm not sure about that. But I can tell you that, you know, this president's wife is really an alien, uh, you know, drag queen or something. I mean, just absolute excel in weirdness. And part of being on your guard is to pay attention to yourself and what you're saying and what you're listening to and what you're being a part of. You're being drug away by weird nonsense and politics and Gosh, you know, oh, David, are you saying we shouldn't have anything to do with politics? I'm not. I think in a democratic society where you contribute to the election of your officials and the policies that they pass, it's good to be engaged. It's good to be engaged. But like so many people are just spun both on the left and the right by the media that they don't have any center. And while Jesus is talking really in verse 13 about his second coming, it's also applicable to our lives where you need to watch, be on your guard. You're not a Republican first. You are a Christian first. You're not even an American first. If you're a true follower of Jesus, you are a Christian first. You're not a white person or a black person first. You are a Christian first. And if that is not honestly how you feel in your heart, then you need to, you need to do a little soul searching. You need to ask the Lord to fix you. Because where you find your identity or what you're most shocked at or, you know, where where you're pulled to the left and the right, you're imbalanced and you're not centered on the Lord and it's not going to be good for you. So you need to that goes for left and right. That goes for Democrat and Republican. That goes for, you know, people outside of America. We need to be centered on the Lord. Watch. You must be on your guard, not paranoid. That's weird and worried about, oh, I think the government's doing that. Yeah, whatever they're doing, you focus on the Lord. Doesn't matter, you know, doesn't mean be paranoid. It means watch. Jesus says, be on your guard. Somebody say amen. Verse 10, the gospel must be preached to all nations. So one of the things that we know about Jesus' second coming is that all nations must uh, hear the gospel. And there is not an effective witness in all nations around the world. So it's important to, to preach the gospel. It is so important. There's such a downplaying of the preaching of the gospel today. In the secular world, if you preach the gospel, their understanding is that you are uh, forcing your culture on other people, and that is wrong. In the church, um, people have adopted so much false theology that there's no hell and, you know, everybody's going to heaven and all this foolishness, really a demonic penetration of universalism is really what it is, that people lack the motivation to go and preach the gospel. Can I tell you, if you've really encountered the Lord, you want to tell people about Jesus. You know, if you go to a great Mexican food restaurant and you have the best taquitos or the best salsa verde that you've ever had, you are going to tell people. My kids weren't here one day uh, in California and I brought them to In-N-Out right away, right away. Why? Because I'm a good father. That's why. Why? You, If you have something good, you're going to tell people about that good that you have. And if you're not telling people about Jesus, it's because it's not center enough for you or you're so overwhelmingly concerned about what everybody thinks that you can't live for God. And I don't mean that in a condemning way. I just mean that in the sense that we need to get back to an ethic, just like we need to get back to an ethic of, um, you know, getting in the Bible and every day and in in starting our day and shaping our lives and then hearing our lives to the word of God. We also need to get back to an ethic of preaching the gospel. This needs to be at the forefront of the church in the word, preaching the gospel. This will, this will um, hail G- help Jesus come back sooner until it's done. It ain't going to happen yet for 2000 years. People have been like, Oh, I think Jesus is coming. It ain't happening until the gospel is preached to every nation, all ethnos, all ethnicities. That's what that means. So we gotta, we, we gotta preach the gospel. Oh, I'm sure it's Jesus is coming back. 88 reasons. There was a best-selling book in 1988 that said 88 reasons why Jesus is coming back in 1988. 
And then, then he didn't come back in 88. So they made another one uh, in 1989, 89 reasons. The guy missed it by that much. He missed it by one. So he did another book, made another couple mil, bought a bunch of property. Ironically, if Jesus is coming back, you don't need property, but he bought some. Anyway, thought it was interesting. But the gospel is going to be preached to everybody before Jesus comes back. And then Jesus says, when you are in verse 11, when you are arrested and brought to trial, do not worry beforehand about what you're going to say. Just whatever is given you at the time, for it is not you speaking, but the Holy Spirit. Very important, very important concept. It's not you speaking, but the Holy Spirit. Can the Holy Spirit speak through you? Yes. And if you're in a situation like this where you're brought to trial under under trumped up charges, yes, you can also um, be led of the Spirit. But there are other times where the Lord can speak through you. When you are, this is talking about God speaking through you in a pressure situation. God will speak through you in a pressure situation sometimes. And that is the time that you you need to yield to the Holy Spirit. First, you need to not worry. And Jesus says, don't worry. What you're going to say is going to be given to you. So just say it as you as it comes to you. That's the wisdom and value of this passage. In pressure situations, God will help you. God will give you the right thing to say. He'll give you the wisdom for the situation. I don't know what to do, David. I'm in a situation. I don't know what to do. God will give you the wisdom. But trust him. God will show up. Do you know God shows up stronger in pressure situations? I found. The Lord's always, his presence is always there. He's always good. He always loves us. But he'll show up direct and give wisdom to in these difficult situations. Verse 13, everyone will hate you. But the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. Most people cannot bear under hate. That's why many Christians, and I'm using air quotes sarcastically, many Christians um, will today do not stand firm because they want so much to fit in with the greater culture. They're not secure in who they are. As believers, they so much want to fit in that they don't stand firm. So they compromise the gospel message. They capitulate to purveyors of perversion. They, you know, they, they just follow the world because their desire, their deep and longing desire is that social acceptance. But Jesus is saying, and for the real follower, it's not going to be that way. You're not going to have social acceptance at some time. Sometimes, I mean, the crowd loves you when you're feeding them. The crowd loves you when the miracles are there. The crowd loves you when you're turning water into wine. There'll be a fickle crowd, but when push comes to shove, the, you know, people, the haters will rise up. And if you really take a stand for God, you have to stand firm when the haters are there. Nobody needs to stand firm when the miracles are there and the people are shouting Hosanna and the highest, what God needs are people to stand firm when the haters come. Many will hate you. Everyone, it says, verse 18, will hate you because of me. Now, if people hate you just because, you know, you're ill-tempered, ill-mannered, you know, not, you know, not nice or something, you know, poor, poorly socialized, then that's not them hating you because of Jesus. They're hating you because of you. <laughs> but if people hate you because of Jesus, and that, I mean, that sentiment is probably more prevalent today than it's ever been in my lifetime. People just outright hate Jesus. They're, you know, Jesus phobes. There's, they're God deniers. They're Bible haters, and they are vocal Kate and I were driving back and the kids were driving back. We went to the beach today. That's why I'm this rosy color of red. We were driving back and we saw a highway sign. We're in here in California. Adopt a highway sign. Atheists United. I think it's funny that there's a group of people who unite about what they don't believe in. Like, I don't believe in elves, for example. Don't believe in elves. Um, there are people that do. I think in Greenland or Iceland, they, most of the population still believes in elves, but I don't believe in elves. 
but I'm not going to start a club based on what I don't believe. But they start a club based on what they don't believe, atheists. And I do understand that they think that, you know, believing in God is detrimental and holds us back scientifically. I understand all that. So there are bigger implications than just the elf factor because God plays a big role in our society and elves don't. So I do understand that. But I just thought it was funny because in Texas, it would be First Baptist Church where I'm from. (laughs) First Baptist Church adopts this highway. But this mile of highway that we were on, on the 10 freeway, coming back from from Huntington Beach, was, was adopted by Atheist United. And it's one thing to disagree. I mean, God gives us the right to disagree. Our country's constitution gives us the right to disagree. And we're not here to force anyone to go to heaven, receive salvation, and and, and, and get connected with God. I mean, if people want hell, they can go to hell. People want to live with the devil controlled their life, they can. If they want to live with, you know, their egotistical intellect leading the way, then you're allowed to do that. We're not here to force. We don't force people by convert by the sword. We don't force people to convert by the sword, first of all, because it doesn't work. I mean, uh, you know, you almost would if you could, but that's just not the way God has set it up. And so anyway, but but today people have a vitriol for Christianity, mostly because, um, you know, there are groups in our society who embrace uh, sexual perversion that have really done a great job of manipulating the, the, the soft headed majority of people in our country. And so because people have believed those lies, we're now the bad guy. We're the bad guy. Well, they were the bad guy in Jesus's day, and they've been the bad guy ever since. If you stand for righteousness in an unrighteous world, you are the bad guy. Makes perfect sense. Nobody likes to be told they're wrong. Nobody likes to be told they're going to hell. Nobody likes to be told that they're not right with God and they need to repent. There's a narrow few that do, and that's people who want truth. Nobody wants truth. Mobs don't want truth. Riots don't want truth. People who they don't want facts and reality. They want they're angry. They're angry. They're angry that they were told that they were wrong by their Sunday school teacher. They were angry that they they're told that their religion is the wrong way. And this one is the right. They're angry. So you have Jesus phobe. You have God deniers. You have Bible haters. You have all these kind of people that are it's alive and well today. So Jesus in this verse says, everyone will hate you. And he says, stand firm. Everyone, will, everybody in the church today is trying to fit in. You're not going to fit in if you're a real follower of God. Everyone will hate you. But stand firm. Stand firm. Stand firm to the hate. Stand firm to your testimony. Stand firm in your faith. Stand firm in your confession. I'm not going to deny Christ. I'm going to say I follow Christ. Stand firm in your discipleship. Stand firm in the forgiveness of God. Some people have a hard time standing firm, believing that God has forgiven them. We need to be real active on this front of forgiving people and letting them go. Don't remind them of things that they've done wrong before. Because God's not reminding you of things that you've done wrong before. So don't don't bring that up. We need to stand firm on forgiveness. That's one thing that I'm no I'm no marriage counselor. But if I was, I would say that don't build a case against your spouse. Remember this back in 89, you said, I don't look pretty in the blue dress. And today you're still not putting the toothpaste. Don't build a case. Let it go. Let let that go and forgive. You need to stand firm. So these are the things that we have to stand firm if we're going to follow Jesus. He said, you're going to be hated. There's going to be haters everywhere. You better stand firm. Somebody say stand firm. You got to stand firm. Verse 21. At that time, if anyone says you look, here's the Messiah. Do not believe it. For false messiahs and false prophets will appear before you. They'll perform signs and wonders. So be on your guard. I have told you everything ahead of time. There it is again. Be on your guard. He says it again and again. Be on your guard. Are we on our guard as the church? Are we? Are, I don't think we are. I think we're going to sing another song about how crazy God is about us and how wonderful we are. 
and how God's got it all under control. We don't need to worry about anything. But that's not what Jesus said. He said, be on your guard. But David, isn't God under control? Isn't he forced? Doesn't he love us? Of course he loves us. And he is sovereign. But but in his sovereignty, he's delegated authority to us. And that's why it's important that we be on our guard. That's why it's important that we preach the gospel. That's why it's important that we fast and pray. What we do is very important because we have delegated authority from the Lord. The Lord has delegated authority from us. He doesn't micromanage everything. He leaves it to humans. You want to sin then your area and your, your city and your town, your country, your state, your province is going to be polluted by sin. And because God's delegated authority, you know, I travel all over the world. I go to a region and I can feel it. I can feel the sin. I can feel the heaviness. I can feel the demonic self. I can feel the perversion. I can feel the death. I can feel the suicide. I can feel it. Then I go to a different place and that place is really strong in the gospel and it feels lighter. It feels better. It feels happier. You know, of course we're on the earth, so no place is perfect, but God, this is so important to understand. God has delegated authority. So you need to be on your toes. I love when Jesus is a disciple came and said, Lord, uh, these guys are hungry. Tell them to go dismiss the crowd. Tell them to go get something to eat. He said, you give them something to eat. He said, you give them something. Jesus always puts it back on us. You don't be afraid. You have faith. You give them something to eat. You heal the sick. You couldn't heal the the epileptic boy. You unbelieving generation. You do it. You do it. You do it. Again and again. And you watch and pray. Well, why are you saying this, David, to put a lot of pressure on us to make us feel good? No, I'm saying it to say that you have authority. You've been delegated authority. And what you do is very important. There, there's a huge lie from the enemy that he wants to tell people what they do. And it can be for any reason. You're too old. You're too young. You're too smart. Oh, if you're too educated, you can't do it. Oh, if you're too dumb, you can't even do it. Or if you're not educated or whatever, you're too, you're too good looking. You, you're too not good looking. You're too short. You're too fat. You're too tall. You're too thin. You're too this. You're, too, you're from the wrong country. You're the wrong color. You're the wrong gender. You're the wrong this. And the enemy wants to disqualify you. Oh, your past. Oh, this. Oh, that. The enemy wants to disqualify you and make you think what you don't do is important because it is of the utmost importance. But if you know that it's important, then you're going to take authority and affect change. And if you're on guard, why would Jesus say again and again, be on guard, be on guard, be on guard? We have to wake up and pay attention. We need to be on guard. You know, I, as a leader of my family, uh, am on guard. I'm careful about what we listen to music, what, what TV stuff we watch, what we eat, what we, you know, what school my kids go to, how we start our day. I told Christine and Kate, you know, Hey guys, while I'm teaching on here, you guys, you know, get in the word and Christine writes down her little scriptures and Emily paints a little Jesus picks a wine. I'm on guard. I'm not, you know, I'm not paranoid, I'm not full of fear. I'm sowing the seeds that, of the harvest that I want to reap. Somebody say, be on guard. Be on guard. There's haters everywhere. Be on guard. There's 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 people who don't like you. Be on guard. Stand firm. Stand firm. There's fake messiahs coming out. Be on guard. You know, in Russia, there's this guy in Russia. He was a cop and he says he's Jesus. He has a big old village, million dollar projects. Do you know if you just say and nobody do this, OK, because you'll go to hell. But don't just say if you just say that you're Jesus, you'll have followers. You'll just have some. There's just going to be some people that just, oh, you, you're Jesus? Okay, well, then I better follow you. <laughs> you know, And the, the people, there's a certain amount of people that operate at that level. If you just did that, you could start your own cult. You know, Again, I don't recommend doing that because you're going to get judged incredibly. But there's one in, guy in Mexico, multi-million dollar organization, guy in the Philippines, multi-million dollar organization, guy in Russia. They're all Jesus. Now, I do question the authenticity of that but they all say they're jesus and there was happening this happening now the russian jesus the filipino jesus and the mexican jesus a lot of jesus is out there the real jesus please stand up okay and resist verse 31 this is why we read this heaven and earth will pass away but my words will never pass away Friends, as a believer of Jesus, you need to know the words of Jesus. You need to know what Jesus is talking about. And the only way to do that is to read the Bible. Of course, we can hear his voice. The Holy Spirit will communicate things from Jesus to us. But gosh, we need to be in this word of God every day. 
we need to really absorb it. And I recommend for every time you read the Old Testament, you should read the New Testament two or three times first. You should read it two or three times the New Testament, then read the Old Testament so that you can understand what, what, what the context is for us. But these words of Jesus are precious. That's why we have them in the Gospels. Before we have four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, we have those four Gospels because we need the words of Jesus, the words of Jesus. And Jesus, Jesus said, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. You want something, you know, everybody's looking for some kind of stability. Did you know that in the world? Everybody's like, some people it's money, some people it's relationships, some people it's, you know, they just want to drug themselves into a feeling of not worrying about the instability that there is. Just let me check out via drugs of some kind. Everybody's looking for stability. You want stability? Heaven and earth will pass away. My words will never pass away. Verse 33. What does Jesus say again? Take a wild guess. Be on guard. He's warning. Jesus is about to be crucified. And so, you know, before I leave, like if I go on an international trip, I, you know, talk to my wife and even Christine, my oldest daughter. And I say, hey, you guys make sure to lock the doors. Hey, make sure the gate's locked. Hey, make sure this bill's paid. Hey, why? Right before I'm leaving, I'm giving instruction for their benefit. Jesus is about to be crucified. And of course, he'll be resurrected. But before he's crucified, he's giving last minute directions. Be on guard. Be on guard. Be on guard. I feel the Lord is saying that to us in this hour. Be on guard. Pay attention. Don't slip into wrong theology. Don't slip into a life where you're not disciplined in the word of God and reading the word of God and letting it affect you. Don't slip into not leading your family. Um, if you're a man, you should call to lead your family. If you're a woman without a husband, you're called to lead your family. Um, and David, you mean women can't have any say in the family? Oh, absolutely. I'm not saying that. I'm saying that that men are the head of the household. They're called to be the, the, the leader. And in my house, as a leader, I ask my wife's opinion all the time. And she many times sees things that I don't see. Being the leader doesn't mean you're always right. It just means you're responsible for the outcome. So before the Lord, you're supposed to be the leader um, as a man. And But many men slack their duties and leave the spiritual stuff to their wife. And so if the kids get drugged to church, it's the wife. If, if, if they read the Bible, it's, the it's not so you can sit on the couch, eat Cheetos, watch Jerry Springer, and yell at your wife and say, the Bible says you have to obey me, bring me another Miller Lite. That's not <laughs> good leadership. But it is a funny picture in our mind. But we need to, we don't 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 slack on any of these things. Don't slack on your health. It's so important to be healthy physically and eat right and get some exercise. You, you have to don't let's not slack on any of these. Be on guard. Be on guard. Be on guard. Be on guard. Be on guard against offense. Be on guard against unforgiveness. Be on guard against getting lured by the seduction of the world. Be on guard, be on guard, be on guard on everything. David, are we supposed to be paranoid, scared, unpeaceful all the time? Not at all. Be on guard against things that would take your peace. Be on guard against things that would take your joy. Be on guard. Be on guard of wrong attitudes towards your spouse or your kids. You could, you could, have, you could maybe have a great relationship with your kids. I've seen this happen. The, the, I mean, with your spouse, but your attitude with your kids and your heart is wrong. Be on guard against disrespecting your pastor. I, I would I would go and preach at this church. I won't say where, but I would go there, you know, a couple of times a year or something like this. And the worship leader and his wife were very anointed. And but they had a bad attitude to the pastor. And the pastor was super humble and he would lead in a godly way and all this kind of stuff. And this worship couple would just you know, not respecting, particularly the woman was not honoring the pastor. She had an attitude. She was anointed. She was a good, you know, worship lady and all that. And her husband was awesome and all that. And, and, and I mean, you know, they were important people in the church, but they kept having a bad attitude, kept having a bad attitude, kept having a bad attitude. And one day uh, the lady told the husband <laughs> that they're done with this church. They left they said, we're starting our own thing, you know, whatever. And now they have a barely surviving. I don't even know if it's still going, but they flopped. They're out of fellowship with this good church and who, a guy who was a good pastor. 
And it was all because they didn't keep their attitude in check. Be on guard. you got to walk in humility, man. You, I'll tell you a story. I'll tell you a Texas analogy for humility. Okay, we had this guy. I think his last name was Grange. We all call him Gray Grange. If you have a last name of Grange, you're going to be a big guy probably. This guy, I think he was maybe, I don't want to exaggerate. I think he was 6'4", maybe 6'5". The guy probably weighed about 350 pounds soaking wet. Maybe maybe 370. I mean, he was, a, he was a wall of a man. He was only about 13 or 14 years old, but he was a big kid. And because he was so big, when he played at the lower levels of football, he would just, he was like, it was like Gullerville's travels, you know. <laughs> Sorry. I hit that. And, and, I mean, he would just throw people around. He was so big. But then when he didn't have good technique because it was so easy for him. He could do whatever he wanted. But then when he came up to the big leagues with the big boys, because I was, I guess, 16 or 17 at the time, I was on the top team, the varsity team. Well, they brought this huge kid who was only like 13. He was 12, 13 or 14, something like that. Young. He brought to us the big in the big leagues, and we would knock this guy's head off. Now, I was less than half of his weight, but because I had the right technique, I would we would smash it. I mean, he was our he was our beat up toy, like he was our kicking dog. Like so, so I mean, we had to learn him, as we would say in Texas, we had to learn him not to stand up because his habit was the ball would be hiked, then he would just stand straight up. He was a lineman. You never ever stand up. You stay low, or you get you get cleaned. And this poor kid, he would come and try to use the same technique that he did when he was a man amongst boys. When he got in the big leagues with the big boys, and we would just you know have a little fun until he learned. So quickly he learned to stay low. He had to stay low. And then he did he did well. He might have gone to play college or something. You know, he did really, really well after. But in the beginning, he wasn't this the thing the, what the analogy here is that he wasn't humble. You know, if you don't stay low, if you don't keep on guard against your attitude and you get cocky, you will be made a plaything of the devil. You will be his new favorite toy. Grange was our new favorite toy. I mean, it's a huge target, and we could just knock the snot out of the kid. And it didn't take a long time because after a while you get tired of that and you learn to stay low and he learned to stay low, stay down, stay low. And, 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 and we have to do you, we have to walk in humility. We have to remember that. And, 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 and I mean, it creeps up on everybody. You know, you think are going pretty good. Hey, I can stand up. Boom. You will get your clock clean. So stay low. Somebody say, stay low, be on guard, be on guard against the right attitude, discipline, you know, love, faith, Staying in the word, not having so much influence of the world of entertainment and all this kind of stuff. I'm not saying you can't ever watch a movie or whatever. I'm just saying be on guard and make sure that what's coming through is okay and stay humble. Be on guard against arrogance. Be on guard against so many things that we we have to do uh, in this hour. Watchfulness. Amen. Verse 37. Again, just another warning. Verse seven, what I say to you, I say to everyone, watch. When he says watch, he's not saying like, watch, watch this. He's saying, watch what I told you. Be on guard. Be watchful. I won't, you know, continue to point anymore. Just the church needs to wake up and become more watchful. We need to be not paranoid. We have we have substituted paranoia for watchfulness. We need to enter into watchfulness. Chapter 14, verse 1. Now, now Passover and the festival of unleavened bread were only two days away, and the chief priests and the teachers of the law were scheming to arrest Jesus. So it's festival time. It's Christmas time. It's, it's a holiday. It's 4th of July. But these schemers never stop. What's my point? My point is that schemers don't take it holiday. Schemers don't take a day off. That's why we have to watch so much. That's why we have to be ready. Verse two, during the festival, they said, we don't want to do this during the festival or the people may riot. Verse, verse three, 
While Jesus was in Bethany reclining at the table at Simon the leper, a woman came with an alabaster jar of very expensive perfume made of pure nard. She broke the jar and poured the perfume on his head. Ooh, it's going to get some people upset. Some of those present were saying indignantly to one another, why this waste of perfume? It could have been sold for more than a year's wages. And the money could have given, been given to the poor. And they rebuked this lady harshly. You know, there's an old saying, no unkind deed goes unpunished. <laughs> no good deed goes unpunished. Here's a lady trying to do something nice. And she's getting rebuked by these clowns. Now, to understand why they were rebuking her, they were rebuking her because that was a... You know, today, the average salary in America is like fifty or $55,000 a year, right? So the lady took perfume that cost about $50,000, $55,000 and just poured it on Jesus' head. So the guys are freaking out. They're like, hey, man, we could, we could have used that $55,000. It's a point. It's valid. It's a valid point, but they miss the spirit of what is going on. First of all, God, you may have noticed from Jesus multiplying the fish and the loaves, they don't need money in that sense. They don't survive because they executed a good monetary plan. We need to be responsible with our money, of course, but that they weren't subject to that. They needed taxes that was found in the fish's mouth. They needed bread. Jesus multiplied the multiplied the bread. They needed a donkey. You know, Jesus got a word of knowledge. They got the colt. So provision was going to be there. But these guys were looking at things from a soulless realm. And Jesus rebuked them. This woman has done a beautiful thing for me, you guys. And then he says something very interesting. He says, the poor will be always be with you. And you can help them anytime you want. But I won't always be with you. I think that's very interesting. Are we supposed to help the poor? Yes or no? I didn't hear you. Yes, we're supposed to help the poor. Are we supposed to give everything we have to the poor and never have anything nice? No. Well, Jesus did this for his burial, David. It's You can't make a theology out of it. Jesus' burial was only three days. That comes to about fifteen to $20,000, almost $20,000 a day for perfuming his head. When people, people get mad if preachers or Christians have something nice, sometimes I've noticed that. I've noticed that. I was going on a mission trip and I raised money for it. And a guy who had given donation, this is when I was a university student, a guy who had given a donation saw that I had some new shoes, I had these new nice Nike shoes on. And 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 uh, I'd gotten them for Christmas, you know, somebody had given them to me. I didn't buy them, but I had raised money and he goes, hey, I gave you, you know, I think my shoes were nicer than his. And he was upset. He's like, hey, you got some nice shoes and you're asking me for money for your mission trip? What are you doing? I, I was like, hey, somebody gave them to me. He goes, you should have sold them. I was like, oh, Lord, I think he gave seven bucks. Like, But anyway, <laughs> the point is that being a Christian doesn't mean you cannot have anything nice. This was extravagant. The secular media loves to jump on preachers who have nice things if they have a nice house or car or plane or something like that they love to jump on but they really have a judas spirit and a lot of christians jump on that same plane that plane meaning on that same idea and try to beat up people that are more successful than them mostly because they're jealous but the principle here is jesus didn't have a problem with the fifty-five thousand dollar head wash didn't have a problem with the $55,000 burial um, anointing nard perfume that was put on his head that he you spent $20,000 $20, a day on for three days because he was buried for three days. He didn't, he didn't have a problem with it. I don't think he has a problem, mostly because God doesn't have a problem with provision. Now, again, we shouldn't be wasteful. And this, you could look at this, if somebody did this today, if somebody did this today, it would be seen as wasteful. If somebody did it in the church today, most people would be like the disciples. And other accounts of this, it doesn't say the disciples said it, it said Judas said it. Judas was the treasury, is always sneaking a little bit extra for himself from the treasury. So really, he wasn't ticked 
that about to try, trying to help the poor, he was ticked because he didn't get the money that he could pilfer from the treasury purse. That's what it was really all about. So be careful when people are criticizing preachers or Christians or anyone about spending money because really probably they have a Judas spirit and wish they had that money for themselves. They don't care about the poor. In fact, the people who, um, you know, there's a preacher who got a plane or was getting a plane and, and people just jumped all over him. I knew one guy who had a, a magazine and jumped all over, wrote articles against this preacher and all that. He had a he hundred thousand dollars BMW. I've seen his car. He had a hundred thousand dollar BMW, and he was complaining about the preacher's plane. Well, guess what, buddy? Your little BMW was pretty lavish there too. Some could argue. Yet you think you, you know, it's Judas. They're jealous. That's what it is. So be careful about that. Where would you fall on that if you saw somebody getting a fifty five thousand dollar perfume job? Where would you fall, honestly? Or a fifty million dollar plane? Where would you fall? It's Judas spirit. Be careful. It's not motivated out of care for the poor. It's motivated out of your own wrong desires. I'm not really winning friends and influencing people today, am I? <laughs> Praise God. The poor will always be with you. We are to help them. Jesus isn't saying don't help them, but he's saying you don't give them everything. They're, it's never going to stop. The American government does nothing but give money to poor people all the time, both in our country and all over the world, and it never solves the problem. In fact, really studies show the more you give welfare and things like that, the more people, you know, are uh, just have all kinds of problems, substance abuse, uh, social problems, you know, unwed pregnancies, all this kind of stuff. It just happens again and again and again. It doesn't help. Actually not giving money. I lived in Thailand for many years and my wife's family is from there. My wife's family are government officials and they, they distribute money from the government in emergency situations. So there are floodplains and a lot of farms where my wife's family lives. And the, when the farmers, the farmers will literally die or lose their land if the government doesn't kick them some money in. And the government doesn't want to lose those farmers because they feed the country and they're a net exporter, right? So they export rice. So you can go to a supermarket here in America and buy Thai rice from Thailand because they make so much. But in a flood situation, and maybe it's because of poor uh, flood water management on the government, but the government helps in those situations. But most of the time, you get nothing from the government in Thailand. You get nothing. And guess what? You don't see people on the street homeless like you do here. You don't see multi-generation of people on welfare like you do here. You don't see the problems that you see on a lot of uh, Indian reservations where the government just pumps money, pumps money, pumps money that you do here. Why? Because people have to take responsibility for themselves and they know there's no net. So they have to grow up and go, you know what? I'm going to get a noodle stand. I'm going to have a, a tire repair business. I'm going to do something. I got to I got to work. Because there's no there's no free ride. And your family in Thailand, in Thailand, if you really have a problem, your family will come to your aid. I mean, my I could if I had a problem, I could come to Kate's family and say, hey, you know, I'm in this horrible situation. I'd be embarrassed, but it would be socially acceptable, you know, but but and they could come to me, too, if they had a situation, you know, where they needed something or something like that. But it's done person to person. Why? There's a lot more accountability than when it's done government to government. Fill these papers out. Here's a doctor who likes to write disability for everybody. And here you go. That's our system. And that's why it, 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 it cripples people. It cripples people. And so, you know, there's always going to be poor. You're not going to fix it with money. Jesus didn't fix it. You're not going to fix it, but we still help. I love what we do with the Protein for Life program, the Magdalene Project program that we've done in the past, and any, you know, feedings in Africa that we've done, feedings in India that we've done. I love it. I, you know, I had struggled financially a lot when I was younger, and I know what it feels like not to have enough, and it's a horrible feeling. And so being able to help is a wonderful feeling, but you're not going to fix the problem. And Jesus didn't fix the problem and his disciples didn't fix the problem. And some pastors, 50 million, 60 million dollar planes, not going to fix the problem. And you, you know, you complaining about Jesus's spike nard, $50,000 perfume is not going to fix the problem. So we need to understand this. We need to hold both of these things in contention. We need to help the poor as the Lord leads. And then we also need to understand that it's okay to have nice things or do something nice for somebody or, you know, 
be okay with that. So verse 10, then Judas Iscariot, don't be in that Judas spirit of judging people when they have something nice. Then Judas Iscariot, one of the 12, went out to the chief priests to betray Jesus to them. So they're complaining about the poor on one hand and betraying him on the other. They were delighted to hear this and promised to give him money. See, there it is. Judas didn't care about the poor. He cared about himself. That's what happens a lot of times today. People don't care about the poor. Oh, why does that preacher have a nice car? They don't care about the poor. Look, you can give it to the poor. You care about yourself. He has a better car than you. So he watched over for an opportunity to hand him over. Praise God. So they went up to the Last Supper room. Verse 22, and while Jesus was eating, they took the bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples. And he said, take it. This is my body. Represented his body. Trans, if people tell you it's really, no, it's really his body. It changes into flesh. That's a false teaching. He's speaking figuratively. Okay. Verse 23. Then he took the cup and we did give it thanks. He gave it to them and they all drank it. He said, this is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for many. Truly, I tell you, I will not drink of it again, of the fruit of vine, again, from the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. When they all sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Communion is very important. In Jesus's understanding, it was a mealtime memorial. So when I'm with my family, if we have some bread, I'll say, Lord Jesus, thank you for your Thank you for your body. You know, if we have some whatever wine or grape juice or whatever it is to drink, we can say, Lord Jesus, thank you for your blood. And it's a mealtime memorial. Later um, in, in the Pauline epistles, we find it was used as a church thing during church meals. But really, I, I like I like more the Jesuitic style. I think both are acceptable. Both are clearly biblical. But I like the Jesuitic style, the Jesus style where he did it as a mealtime memorial. It's good to always remember, Jesus, thank you for your body. Jesus, thank you for your blood. Thank you for what you've done. And so Peter, Jesus told the disciples they're going to fall away. Peter's gung-ho, right? And he says, even if all fall away, verse 29, I will fall away. <laughs> even if everybody falls away, Lord, I won't fall away. And Jesus tells them, truly, I tell you, today, yes, tonight, before the roaster cries, crows twice, you yourself will disown me three times. Two, two things to consider here. One, be careful about having a big mouth and making big promises. I'm cautious about this myself because I promise the thing, things to the Lord and I have it. It didn't happen. And I've had to apologize, you know, and repent for that. So sometimes we're, we make big promises, but we don't follow through. So instead of that, say, Lord, please help me do this. I want to do this for you, but I know I can only do it by your grace. Don't talk big. Act big. Talk small. Talk small and act big. In sports, we would say, show, show us by the way you play, not by your big mouth. Everybody can talk big. Can you play big? That would be one thing. The other thing is be cautious against people who talk a lot. In, in Thailand, they, they call it bakwan. They call it sweet talk. That means you're saying nice things, but there's a there's an understanding that you're not going to do nice things. Like sometimes I'll tell my wife, I, she'll say something nice. I'll go, honey, you're so sweet. She goes, I'm not being sweet. I'm being honest. <laughs> I go, no, in English, it means something a little bit different. But in, in the Thai language, if you say you're being sweet, there's an implication that it's not sincere. And in the same way, you know, there are people that say we're lifers. We're friends for life, brother. And then they'll stab you in the back or they'll say, oh, I'm with you. I'm with you. I'm going to support your ministry. I'm going to be with you. You never hear from them again. You know, it, it happens a lot. And, and it doesn't just happen to me. It just happens to everybody in, in life and stuff. But the biggest talkers are the ones. I love the Lord. I had this one guy who I met. I won't say where because um, I'm not trying to hurt anybody's feelings or anything. But I met him 
and he was just, he was a young guy. He was a university student. And, and he, we were telling him, I was telling him about the ministry stuff I was doing. And he just got this look in his eye, like my life is Disneyland and his life is, you know, the short end of the stick. And he's like, you're so lucky, man. Oh, I love God so much. I wish I could do that. And I just sensed a hunger in him. And I go, you know what? You finish up here at school and you come intern with me, you come to LA and blah, blah, blah. And I was planning to buy him a car and I set him up with a place to live and blah, blah, blah. But you know, what happened was he came and we did morning prayer and got up, we got up kind of early. We we're getting up a little bit early for morning prayer. And then before you, after about two or three days, it's like, it's, why do we have to get up so early? Is the Lord not, not available later in the day, you know? And then I would try to, and then, then I, you know, he was, I don't want to go into detail, but he was kind of had some bad habits that more godly and, you know, I was trying to help him rein in and stuff. And anyway, long story short, the guy lasted about two weeks. And what I found was, and what I learned from that was people are big talkers, but not big actors. I, I look for people who are big actors, people, people who act, not actors in the sense of hypocrites or play actors in the sense of not, not acting like pretending, meaning acting, but like action. I look for people who are big by their action. Oh, I love God so much. Yeah, the, the guy who shouts the loudest in the meeting is not always the one who gets up and reads the Bible and is faithful to his wife and does the right thing and ties, and you know, witnesses. And, you know, it really loves the Lord. They're the big shouters because they, they, they've developed a habit of, of acting big, but not, 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 you know, pretending to be enthusiastic for the Lord, but it's in the meeting. It's like a meeting persona that they put on. So look for the people that don't talk big, but act big. As you know, the story, Peter denies Jesus three times, um, you know, and, and he wasn't able to back up his talk with action. Talk less, act more. Talk less, act more. Verse uh, 37 he, he, he told people to pray. Let me back up to verse 36. This is very important. Jesus is praying. His death is impending. He says, Abba, Father, everything. I want, this is so important. Abba, Father, everything is possible for you. Everything is possible. Is that true? Yeah. Take this cup from me. Everything is possible for God. True. Take this cup from me. Not going to do it. So God can, do you know if I could, I would keep every sadness, sickness, disappointment, hurt, failure from my kids. If I could, if I could, I would. Just because it kills me to see them sad in any way. It absolutely kills me. So if I could, I would stop all of life's problems for them. And God can. And this is what Jesus was wrestling with. God, you can do anything. I'm about to be killed by some murderous, mean people and dishonored, stripped naked and flogged. And they're going to have fun with it. They're not just going to euthanize me. They're going to hurt me and have fun all the while doing it. And it's this is serious. So, God, you can do anything. Can I please not go through this? Understandable. Understandable, right? Take this cup from me, Lord. There's got to be another way around this. I have to die. I have to get I have to cat of nine tails. You've seen it all already in the spirit, no doubt. Can't you do? Can't we do another play here? Isn't there another way to deal with this? Hmm. Sober moment. And it brings up the age old question. Why do bad things happen to good people? Or if God is a good God, why does he let us go through stuff? And this is a very fair philosophical question. God, everything's possible for you. You're omnipotent. You're omnipresent. You can do everything. You know everything. So can we figure another way out of this? And this is... What the church does, I'm, I'm, I, have a, I got saved at a word of faith church. I love the word of faith, but in, in some ways, the word of faith implications are if you have enough faith, you'll never suffer anything. That's the shortcoming in this group of word of faith. I mean, they have so many great things to contribute. 
gosh, they have great things to contribute. But the one thing they don't have so great to contribute is that if you go through a problem, sometimes the implications in some circles are that you don't have enough faith. And the reality is, is that God allows you to suffer certain things for his purpose. I, when I got baptized with the Holy Spirit, I was suicidal, almost killed myself. I went through the darkest hell. I would not wish it on my worst enemy. I have enemies. Uh, you know, I have enemies. People, if you stand for God, will hate you, particularly religious people. <laughs> I have enemies that have gone in great lengths to try to attack me, and I would not wish this the situation I had on them. I don't. I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't wish it on them. I pray for them. I do. I pray for them. I worry about their, you know, the judgment that's going to befall them. But I do pray for them. I do forgive them. I push myself to do it. But I absolutely would not wish what I, I went through such a dark time. I went through. Do you know the point that you have to get to be suicidal? Do you know that point? I was 21 years old. I had my own business. I own my own house. I bought my first house when I was 19 years old a government program, HUD program. I mean, I I went to university. I, I had professional soccer teams looking at me to play professional in Mexico and Europe. And after I finished university, I mean, I had a pretty girlfriend. I had everything going, not as pretty as my wife, of course, but pretty, you know, and, and, and like I had everything going for me and I wanted to kill myself. Friends, it was so horrible. And it was a season. It didn't last one day. It lasted a while. I would say months. Just talking about it right now, I just, I feel this like, oh, it was so horrible. And God could have taken that cup from me, but he didn't. Why? It was part of his purpose that I could be humbled so that I could receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And that's what happened. That's what happened. I was broken. I mean. I wanted him to take that cup from me, but he didn't. He allowed me to suffer it. And I've had other cups that I don't like. But it's part of it. And then Jesus says, not what I will, but what you will be done. Verse 38, watch and pray so that you don't fall into temptation. Friends, watch and pray so you don't fall into temptation. Watch and pray. Well, no, I'm the made the perfect of Christ. I, the grace is on me and I don't have to do anything of works and all. Watch and pray so you don't fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Verse 38. When this is talking about the flesh, it's not talking about carnality, the flesh of the lower man that is unredeemed the unredeemed part of our heart and mind and thought. It's not talking about the flesh, fleshly ways. Those who sow to the spirit will reap of the spirit. And those who sow to the flesh will reap of the flesh, of destruction. It's not talking about carnality. It's talking about our physical body. Jesus is saying the spirit is willing, but you guys are falling asleep because your flesh is weak. Your physical ability to do your spiritual task is not there. We need to take care of our physical bodies. Can you say amen? The older I get, the more I'm kind of like, okay, got to learn some new ways. Need to exercise. Need to, well, it's not spiritual. No, the spirit is willing, but your body can't do what you're supposed to do because you're not being a good steward of it. I'm talking to myself as much as I'm talking to anybody else. So we got to do that. Somebody say, stay up. Yeah, stay up. Verse 50, this is a sad verse. It said, everyone, Jesus, uh, Judas betrayed him. And then he said, then everyone deserted him and fled. Everybody deserted Jesus and fled. Verse 51, I think this is just kind of put in there to explain how much they deserted him. It says, a young man wearing nothing but a linen garment was following Jesus. When they seized him, he fled naked and left the garment behind. It's like... It's like Joseph in Potiphar's house. Get away from me, lady. And he took off. I mean, it, it, it just feels like just it, the Lord let it come into the scripture just to show how quickly everybody just went, pew, skedaddled, got out of there. Leaving his garment behind. Verse 54, this is interesting. It says, Peter followed at a distance. You know, when you follow, when Jesus was doing the miracles, everybody followed close. When he turned, turned the water into wine, everybody was his best pal. When he was 
multiplying the bread, everybody was on his team. When he walked on water, everybody said, you're God, you're God, you're God. When he has problems, follow at a distance, right? Follow at a distance. You know, if you follow Jesus at a distance, you're really subject to sin. You're really, really subject to sin. Verse 56, many tested falsely against their statements, uh, or excuse me, falsely against him, Jesus, but their statements did not agree. There's an old saying, honesty is the best policy. Friends, when you, what a tangled web we weave when at first we start to deceive. I don't know if that's the exact way it goes, but the point is that if you live a life of honesty, you don't have to worry about getting your story straight. Here, they were all trying to testify. They were trying to get Jesus killed. So they all made it up. But they, even the chief priests and rulers are like, these testimonies won't work. <laughs> They're not consistent. Friends, be an honest person. Do And if you haven't been, correct your way right now. Get honest. You, you're, you're weaving a tangled web if you deceive, just like these not so bright ones did. As you know, the story, Jesus, you know, got taken up and he was called a blasphemer and all these kind of things. And verse 67, Peter bet betrays Jesus, denies Jesus. Little girl, wasn't a big soldier, little girl. You were with him. No, I wasn't. And a, a servant girl, a slave girl said, this fellow was one of them. No, it wasn't, not me. And then another guy came up and said, hey, you, you, you were with Jesus. You're from Galilee. I can hear your accent. Verse 71. Then he began to call down curses and swore to them. I don't know what this man, this man you're talking about. Peter was out of fellowship with the Lord. He's going back to his old cursing sailor ways. He was cussing like a sailor because he was a sailor, a fisherman. When you follow Jesus from afar, you're not the best version of yourself. You're not who you're supposed to be. You're not who you're called to be. If you deny Jesus, you follow from afar. You literally, he says, pulling, calling down curses on himself. It's one thing to curse other people. It's another thing to curse yourself. <laughs> Peter was cursed. He was, he was, he was, he was calling down curses on himself. And then he remembered, verse 72, then he remembered the word Jesus had spoken to him. Before the rooster crows twice, you will disown me three times. And he broke down and wept. Do you know what I love? The voice of the Lord convicted him. Think about this. Judas denied Jesus one time. Peter denied Jesus three times, which is worse. Judas, because he, he didn't weep like Peter. If you've messed up, Peter messed up, friends. We're going to close now. Peter messed up. If you've messed up, weep over your sin. Repent over your sin. It was the word of God that brought that conviction to Peter. Get in the word of God. David, I've messed up. Get in the word of God. David, I've gone the wrong direction. Maybe you messed up for a long time. Maybe you messed up really bad. In fact, maybe you would go to jail if people found out how you messed up. Or maybe you would lose your marriage if you, people found out how you messed up. Or maybe you'd lose your ministry if people found out how you messed up. Guess what? Repent. Give your life to the back to the Lord. Weep over your sin. Turn from it. Turn from it and get right with God. Amen. Let's pray. Father, thank you for a chance to study your word. Thank you for the sacrifice that was made for us. Lord Jesus, thank you that you wrestled and you said, Lord, Lord, everything's possible for you. If you can't take this cup from me, but you said, not, not my will, but your will. You wrestled with your own will and you did the will of the Father. Lord, we can never do that on our own, but by your grace, we can help us do that. Help us be on guard in everything we learned today. Listen, help us internalize it, Lord. Jesus, mighty name. And everybody said, amen. If you would, if you found this helpful, share. If you like you know, to connect with our ministry more, you can do so at davidtomberland.com. Thank you for praying for us. Thank you for praying for uh, the ministry and uh, just be a person of the word and it will transform your life. It's not a quick fix overnight, get rich, quick scheme. It is, it is, it is a lifestyle that will transform you and will bless you. Love being with you today. Look forward to seeing you again soon. Go to YouTube and subscribe and you can get these videos every time. All right. Bye-bye.